Okay, John, we are live. We are live for our Eucharistic Conference. Hello, Eucharistic Conference friends. Boy, what a treat uh, this weekend will be. I know for so many of you, as you've already dove in uh, to the process here and just been able to tap into dozens of Catholic speakers and um, and really cultivate a deeper love and devotion to our Eucharistic Lord. I, I don't think it'll ever happen fully. Um, it's a life that we will continually dive deep into. It's a life where we will continually convert our lives over to, and it's a love that will continually deepen. Uh, conferences like this are here to help. And one of the treats about these conferences is we bring on different live interviews and guests to be able to help us dive, dive deeper into it. And uh, who better than a bishop in the Catholic Church today? Uh, this keynote note is live from Bishop Cousins. He is the Auxiliary Bishop in the Archdiocese of Minneapolis, St. Paul. He's got a phenomenal story. We're going to tap into that during the interview portion of it, uh, a very uh, pro-life story, but also uh, a deep love uh, for our Eucharistic Lord, especially in his priesthood. Uh, he's here. I want to welcome you, Bishop. Thank you for doing this for us, and we're going to have some fun. There he is. The opportunity to address everyone. I'm going to let you take the reins. Great. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit in the beginning here about uh, the centrality of the Eucharist in our faith. And just to expand a little bit what it means to say the Eucharist is the source and the summit of our faith. And some of these are things that we know, but actually it's really important that we enter deeply into these realities to reverence them because when we reverence them, we grow in our love of the Lord. And what I want to do is um, just point out this kind of simple fact, which is the Eucharist, we say, is the source and summit of our life, but it's been the source and summit of the, our life as the church from the beginning, right back from the very beginning. I want to read you a description of the Eucharist. This is a, an, a description of the Eucharist. On the day we call the day of the sun, all who dwell in the city or the country gather together in the same place. The memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read as much as time permits. When the reader is finished, he who presides over those gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful things. Then we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves and for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss of peace. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water with wine mixed together to him who presides over the brethren. He takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, for, and for a considerable time he gives thanks. The Greek word there is Eucharist, that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present give voice to an acclamation by saying, Amen. When he who presides has given thanks and the people have responded, those whom we call deacons give to those present the Eucharisted bread, wine, and water, and take them to those who are absent. Now, any Catholic who's been to Sunday Mass would recognize this as a description of what we do on Sunday Mass. It's the Lord's Day. We gather together. We have the readings. We have a homily. We have the petitionary prayers. And then there's a prayer where the presider gives thanks and the Eucharisted bread, which we, which is the body and blood of Christ, is given to everybody. The difference, of course, is that this description was written in the year 155 by St. Justin Martyr. Sometimes, you know, when I was a parish priest, the high school students would say, Father, Mass is boring. We do the same thing every week. And I would say, you know, we've been doing the same thing every week for a very, very, very long time since the beginning, since the earliest Christians gathered in houses with the apostles or the soon-to-be martyrs gathered secretly in the catacombs of Rome during the persecution, in the largest and most beautiful basilicas in Europe and in foxholes during war times, from China to India, from Africa to California, every week, in fact, every day, Christians have gathered together and a priest has stood in their midst with bread and wine and said the words of Jesus over that bread and wine, offering prayer and praise to God. And those Christians 
have received the gift of eternal life, the very body and blood of Jesus poured out for them. St. Justin Martyr, describing in the very same document, 155, describes the Eucharist this way. He says, we do not receive this as common bread and common drink. We are also taught that the food made Eucharist by the word of the prayer that comes from him, by his words, is the flesh and blood of the same incarnate Jesus. This is the food which has been the strength of Christians in every generation, in every place, at every time, from St. Augustine in the fourth century to St. Francis in the 12th century to Mother Teresa in the 20th century to you and me today in the 21st century. This is the food that Jesus spoke about when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. This is the reality that is the source and the summit of our faith. Now, the truth is many people don't understand all this. And so I want to talk about why it's so central and why it's the source and summit of our faith. Sometimes, as I said, people find mass boring. And I always say, well, if you think mass is boring, then you don't have any idea what's going on. My mother, of course, she finds football boring, but that's because she doesn't know the rules. <laughs> my father and my brother-in-law, they know what's going on. They don't find it boring at all, right? What happens at Mass? Let me tell you straightforwardly what happens. The Mass is the most important event in the history of the world because it makes present the most important event in the history of the world and the most important person who performed that event. The Mass really and truly contains Jesus Christ, a living person, and it really and truly makes present his death and resurrection. Now, here's the problem for us as Christians. The problem is Jesus lived among us. He taught. He suffered. He died. And all that happened long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. How do we experience those realities that happened 2,000 years ago today? How do the effects of that reality come to me today. Am I only supposed to remember them the way I remember the stories about my grandfather in the Second World War? Or is there a way I can have real contact with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? God does provide a real way for real contact. And to understand this, you have to understand two things. First, what is a sacramental world view? And second, what does it mean to remember sacramentally? So let's explain those two things. First, what is a sacramental worldview? Well, one of the reasons people don't understand the Mass is because they don't see the world correctly. Most people today have what I would call a scientistic worldview. Science is, of course, a good thing. It's a great uh, gift to our lives and has provided many wonderful accomplishments, including this ability for me to speak to you virtually. But a culture of scientism is a different thing. Scientism says that only thing, the only things that are real are things that can be scientifically proven, things which we can see or touch. And that's just not true. Reality is so much deeper than what I can see with my eyes or sense with my senses. And truth is so much greater than what can be proved scientifically. And the fact is that the things which people really care about can't be proven. If you held a gun to my head and said two plus two is five, I would agree with you because I don't really care about math that much, right? But I cannot prove that my mother loves me. I can't, I mean, I can give you examples of her love you know, and there were all the times that she cared for me and she stayed up late to help me and she drove me lots of places. But how do I know my dad wasn't paying her on the side? How do I know that, in fact, she wasn't working out her own guilt from her own childhood? And yet if my mother's life was in danger, I swear I would do everything I could to save it because I'm much more convinced about my mother's love for me than I am about basic scientific facts. No one thing proves it. The fact is everything proves it. And the same is true about God. 
How can I prove God's existence? The unbelievable majesty of the mountains, the beauty of each flower, the fact that the sun came up again this morning as it always does, the fact that I can laugh and dream, I can love and hate, the fact that people care so much about ideas, that music and art are so beautiful, the fact that love is real. No one of these things proves God's love for me, but in fact, they all prove it. And even though it cannot be proved scientifically, it's much more clear and people are willing to die for it and they have died for it. This is how Christians see the world. The world for the point of a Christian is that everything that exists points to the reason that it exists. It points to the invisible truth of the whole world. The Christian world sees everything sacramentally. All of created reality is itself a sacrament. It points to the deeper and most important truth that God created the world. The material world is not a random scientific accident. It was created by God and it speaks constantly of its creator. And all things in this master design point to the master designer because the world itself is a sacrament of God's glory. It reveals God's glory. Now, what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a physical, tangible thing, a sign that makes present a deeper, invisible, more important reality. A good example of a sacrament is physical contact. There are different kinds of physical contact and they say different things. You know, there's getting bumped on the street which doesn't mean anything. But then there's the teenage girl who gets bumped in the hallway by the guy she idolizes and it changes her whole day because she got so close to him. And then there's a kiss. A kiss carries with it love and reverence. A kiss is a sacrament because it's meant to portray deep meaning. This is why the priest kisses the altar when he begins mass or why he kisses the words of the gospel this is why St. John Paul II used to kiss the ground whenever he would land in a new country. It's an act that reveals the reverence and love of the heart. Now apply that to the sacraments we celebrate, which are so much more than just rituals. Why? Because they make present what they signify. Sacraments provide a unique encounter with the living power of God. And here's a very important point, because that's not just an intellectual encounter. It's not just a thought or an idea. It's a physical encounter. Water is poured over that baby, and that baby is changed, really. Eternal life enters into that child. Bread and wine are offered on the altar, and the words of Christ are said over the bread and wine, and the bread and wine are changed, really, and then the life of God his body, blood, soul, and divinity comes into us when we receive it. And this is not the same as virtual reality. Very important for us to understand, especially in a time where sometimes the only access we had to our faith was through online resources. It's not the same as a sacrament. A sacrament's more like a kiss, real contact, a real encounter real love that comes to me through my senses and fills me with the life of God and transforms me. And this is how we can understand what's happening at mass. When we speak of mass, we say it's a memorial, which comes from our word to remember. What does it mean to remember sacramentally? Jesus's last command at the, at the last supper, what he said was, do this in memory of me. What is memory and what happens when we remember? Well, memory is a faculty which we have and a way of making present in our mind something that happens in the past. We call it to mind in our imagination. It happens again in our imagination and it can be even quite strong. We've all had the experience, for example, of having a dream that really shakes us. It's something that happened in our imagination, but it really affects us. I remember, for example, the first time I held my niece when she was a newborn baby, I was present for her birth. And I, re I remember it so well, I, didn't, I never held something I so much didn't want to drop. But what happens when the church makes memory? 
when we remember as Jesus commanded us to remember. You see, here's what happens. God lives outside of time and all things are present to him. And when the church remembers this event of Jesus's death and resurrection, time and space collapse, they're annihilated. And they eventually, in that moment, the event actually becomes present to us here and now through the power of God's memory. And this is what happens at mass. We enter into God's time and here and now time and space collapse and Jesus himself becomes present, his death and resurrection become present so that we can share in that event. This is what Jesus was doing at the Last Supper, if you pay attention. When Jesus says, take this, all of you, and eat it, this is my body given up for you. When he says, take this, all of you, and drink from it, this is my blood poured out for you. Jesus is making present the cross before it happens. He's remembering the cross, which is going to happen the next day. That's the moment when he gives up his life for us. What he says at the Last Supper is intimately, sacramentally connected with what he does on the cross. And when we celebrate Holy Mass and the priest stands there faithful to Jesus' command and says those words in his person, the same thing happens. Time and space collapse and three times become one. The Last Supper, the death on the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus. All three times become one here, now, on this altar, in this church, so that we can live from this mystery and we can unite our worship of God to Jesus' worship, which he offered on the cross to the Father. This is, of course, why we surround those words with such solemnity. It's why we sing holy, 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 because the angels are always singing that before the throne of God in heaven. It's why we kneel at this most important moment because of the reverence for what's taking place on the altar. And the priest reverently says those words and we become present to Christ. His saving death and his resurrection are all present there. And it's why we cry out. We proclaim your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection until you come again. Now, when Jesus says, it's important to remember this truth, right? Jesus is God and his words are true. And when Jesus says, this is my body given up for you, this is my blood poured out for you, it actually happens. The bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that they change in their appearances, but it means that their essence or their substance changes. It means there's no more bread there. There's no more wine there. What's there? Jesus. His body, his blood, his soul and divinity all present under the appearance of bread and wine. The appearances remain, but the essence or the substance changes. Now that's a great miracle. Just as miraculous as when Jesus created wine out of water at the wedding of Cana, or when Jesus created everything out of nothing. He actually transforms the bread and the wine from within and then makes himself present in a way that has no shape or size or any other uh, appearances because it's all under the appearances of bread and wine. This is the incredible power of the church's remembering. When Jesus told his apostles, do this in memory of me, he gave them the power to perform the same miracle, to say his words and to have his death and his resurrection and his very self become present. This is what it means when we say the priest acts in persona Christi. Only Christ can say over bread, this is my body and have it become his body or over wine, this is my blood, and have it become his blood. The priest can only do that because he shares in the very power of Christ. And so what happens at every mass 
is that we believe on the altar of the center of that church, Jesus pours out his life anew. And when you come to communion, you receive his resurrected life. And as Jesus told us, we know that those who receive his resurrected life will never die. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus is God, and his words are true. Now, on the night before Jesus died, he said to his disciples, no one has greater love than to lay down their life for one's friends. And this is exactly what the Eucharist is. Jesus laying down his life for his friends. He pours out his life so that we can share in his life. And in this gift, he gives us himself and makes himself present and makes present his life-saving death and resurrection. Which is why we should remember whenever we celebrate this ritual that it's not a mere ritual. It contains Christ himself. It contains his death. It cost Jesus his life to give us the Eucharist. And therefore, we should never receive this, as St. Justin Martyr said, as common or ordinary bread and wine. When we see it with faith, we see that this gift contains all of Jesus' life, and he pours it out so that we can receive it, so that we can live from this gift. I, I remember a moment when this truth came home to me in a very personal way. You know, I, I grew up in a good Catholic family and we went to mass every Sunday. And I remember being taught by my parents and even by my parish priest about Jesus's presence in the Blessed Sacrament. And I remember being taught to genuflect and why we knelt during mass because Jesus himself was present here. And I have to say that I, I grew up never doubting the real presence of Jesus in the sacrament. Even in my youngest days, I, I, I believe Jesus was really present on the altar. However, when I was in my last year of seminary, a, a thought did occur to me. I was only a few months away from becoming a priest. And I thought to myself, well, it's easy for me to believe that it's really Jesus's body and blood there on the altar when I see another priest consecrate the bread and wine. But will I believe it when I consecrate the bread and wine? What would happen when I said those words? Well, I can tell you that the day that I stood at the altar in the Cathedral of St. Paul when I said my first Mass, and I bent over that bread and wine and I said the words of Jesus, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. And then I sat down the Eucharist on the patent and I genuflected. I had no doubt that I was genuflecting before the Lord of all the universe. This is the power of the church's remembering. This is why the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life. It contains Christ himself, his life, which is given for us. It allows us to participate in this true worship of, the of Jesus to the Father, and it allows us to receive the gift of eternal life. Thank you very much. I wanna thank you for that. That was, um, that was wonderful, uh, it really was. And in fact, a couple things stuck out to me as I was sitting here listening. One was this line that you said, you said, everything that exists point to, points to a reason that it exists, right? Everything that exists points to a reason that it, that it exists. You know, uh, science, a, a great gift from God, right? But scientism, this idea that uh, I have to put God under a microscope or he's not there or he's not real. Uh, this is what we as uh, men and women of faith, hopefully, are trying to convey to the world that it is not so. And you just had a lot of gold nuggets there. Before we before we kind of get to some of those points, I want to kind of go back because you you spoke really beautifully about your mom and dad and how they kind of cultivated a, uh, that that devotion to our Lord. Was this something, you know, kind of ingrained every day? I mean, you, you didn't miss mass. This was stapled into your family, maybe a rosary or devotional practice here and there. Tell me about what it was like growing up. Yeah, you know, uh, we were the family that um, often did things around the church. So the priest 
Uh, our, my parish priest, Monsignor Barry, was an off-the-boat Irishman, and uh, he had a great sense of humor. And uh, I remember when my parents first called, we had moved to Colorado, and I was four years old, and they called the parish and, to find out what time Mass was. And Monsignor said, oh, Mass is at, you know, 930, and if you don't like, come, and if you don't like it, we'll give you your money back, you know. And he had a great sense of humor. And But we were the family then that just were, were involved in the things of the church. So Saturday mornings, we were often at the church cleaning out the little vigil lights and doing these sorts of things. But what happened to me was when I was in first grade, Monsignor Barry came into my classroom and he said, is Andrew Cousins here? I said, yes, Monsignor. He said, could you step out in the hallway? And I thought I was in trouble and I did step out in the hallway. And then he said, do you know your act of contrition? And then I really thought I was in trouble. I said, yes, Monsignor. He said, well, start saying it because you're going to make your first confession. So I made my first confession in the hallway of the school. And then he said, tell your mom this Sunday you're making your first communion. So I was in first grade. So this is a year ahead of all of my classmates, right? And uh, what happened was Monsignor Barry found out that he was going to be retiring and leaving the parish, and he wanted me to serve Mass for him before he retired. So he had me make my first communion a year ahead of my classmates so I could start serving Mass, even though I was a small, tiny kid, you know. And uh, really, it was that experience of being close to the altar and the reverence that I could see Monsignor had for the Eucharist that made me want to live close to the Eucharist. And so that it was just kind of always with me, that love for the Eucharist, you know, and that really was what helped give birth to my vocation. And was this something where maybe you're hitting fourth, fifth, sixth grade and you're thinking this is this is where I'm being called? I mean, it just kind of never left you. Or is there a time where you thought, no way I'm getting married? Yeah, it, it was like that. It would never left me. It was always in the back of my head. But I found out in high school, it wasn't the best way to get dates. If people asked you, what are you going to be when you grow up? And you said, I'm going to be a priest, you know? So I didn't talk about it <laughs> because I wanted to have normal experiences and I did all that. Um, but whenever I started to really seriously think about my life, I started to think about priesthood. You know, my parents had also told me, you mentioned this before, you know, I, I, I was a sick child and my parents had often, always told me, they said, you know, God spared your life because he has a plan for it. And your job is to figure out what that plan is, you know, and uh, that's, of course, true of everybody. Right. No, no life is an accident. God spares every life because he has a plan for it. But that was always ingrained in me from a young age that God had a plan for my life. And I had to figure out what that plan was. You went to Benedictine College. Is, is it as Catholic as it is now when you were there? It's more Catholic now than it was when I was there. <laughs> I like to think that I was part of helping it become more Catholic. Uh, but they were good years. I really learned a lot from the monks there. And some of those monks were real also mentors for me in my vocational discernment. And there are 10 priests who were part of the 650 students at Benedict College when I was there. Now, of course, Benedict College is over 2000 students. It's had such a great track record. And it's become one of America's great Catholic colleges. Just a couple of weeks ago, I got to give the commencement address there. So to the graduates of 2020 and 2021. So that was a great gift. You're ordained a priest, uh, I want to say a few years later. I mean, you're ordained a bishop, right? I mean, at 45 when you were ordained a bishop, very young in the realm, uh, in, in the realm of, uh, of ordinations for bishops. Um, were you nervous? I mean, do you remember getting that call and thinking, is this a joke? <laughs> yeah, uh, I do remember. Everybody remembers the call, you know. It's one of the few times when God's call comes over your cell phone <laughs> in life. And uh, this was one, this is one of them, you know. And so... Uh, it, it was 2.59 on Tuesday, October 1st, 2013, the Feast of St. Therese, which was a great consolation to me. And uh, the phone rang and I saw it was a Washington, D.C. number. I thought it was my friend who's a priest in Washington, D.C., so I didn't answer the phone. I let it go to voicemail. And I was on my way to a formation meeting. And then after that, I was working in the seminary, so I was teaching in the seminary. After the formation meeting with one of the seminarians, I checked the voicemail and the voicemail was from um, Sister Mary Joanna Ruland, who is a religious sister, mercy, sister of mercy. And she, at the time, was the papal nuncio's secretary. And so um, she's, but the thing is, she's from St. Paul. And she, before she was a sister, she was my sister's roommate. So I knew her. And I thought, well, she said, you know, the papal nuncio wants to call you. Please call as soon as possible. The papal nuncio wants to speak to you. And I thought, what did she tell the papal nuncio about me? You know, and then I, so I called the papal nuncio and, uh, I, you know, I got the front desk basically. And I asked for Sister Mary Joanna Rulin and they said she's gone home for the day. And I said, well, she said the papal nuncio wanted to speak to me. And 
he, they said, what's your name? I said, Andrew Cousins. And he said, oh, I'll put you right through to the papal nuncio. At that moment, I started to get a little nervous, you know, and then the papal yeah. nuncio, uh, he just said a simple sentence. He said, um, he said, I need to inform you that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has nominated you to be the auxiliary bishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis. Do you accept? And I paused. <laughs> I knew, you know, things a lot goes through your mind in that moment. <laughs> like, I knew I had a couple of yeah. options. I could talk to my spiritual director because I'd heard about other people doing this. But the last two bishops out of my archdiocese had the same spiritual director I did. And so I knew what he was going to say. He was just going to tell me to say yes. So, so I said yes. And I remember two things. I remembered the line I used to teach the seminarians in formation, which is this. The legitimate command of your legitimate superior is the will of God for you. So that went through my head. And I thought, well, Pope Francis certainly is my legitimate superior. And then the second one was St. Therese when she said, just have confidence. And so that with her voice ringing in my head, I said, yes. I mean, I, I remember when we found out all three of our kids, you know, that, that my wife was pregnant and, you know, there's that like month, month and a half where we, we just didn't tell anyone, wanted to, you know, go and make sure this was real. It was happening before we made the big announcements. And it was just like bottling this thing in that we were so excited about. I mean, was that what it was like? <laughs> Could you go out and just tell everyone you're posting it on Facebook, your Instagram, or are you? No, you're no, like, no. Right, you're, under, you you're under papal secret for the first about two weeks. So they have to coordinate with the announcement in the new diocese, or in my case, it was the same diocese, but they have to coordinate with the bishop and they had to coordinate with the office in Rome. And so um, you have to pick a date for the announcement. And so that was about 10 days out. So for those 10 days, you can't tell a soul you're under papal secret. If you tell anybody you're excommunicated. And so <laughs> I couldn't even tell my own parents until the very night before it was announced. The uh, archbishop at, told me to call my parents the night before and tell them, but you know, that was about 9 p.m. the night before. So and when I called my parents, uh, I called and I said, Mom, get Dad on the phone. I got something important to tell you. And so then Dad's on the phone. I said, now, what I'm about to tell you is a secret, and it's a really big secret. It comes from the Pope. And my mom started to cry. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be the auxiliary bishop of St. Paul, Minneapolis. And she said, Indianapolis, that's terrible. <laughs> I said, and my dad said, no, he said Minneapolis. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> I love it, so yeah, I love with it. that time on the papal secret, and then it's announced at 5 a.m. noon Rome time, but 5 a.m. St. Paul, Minneapolis time. And that's when the, the, the cell phone lights up and the world changes. You're a priest forever. And, um, you know, now now you've, you know, experiencing that, of course, in the seminary as a teacher, but now as a, a bishop, um, you know, this is in the days we live in today, especially for bishops, um, this is. This is no small feat, what our Lord is asking of you, um, and especially in the culture in which we live, that I think in, in you know, of course, we see this throughout church history, but in, in recent memory, at least for my life, I've never seen um, so much animosity out in our world mm -hmm. um, against our bishops as well. What do you have to say to that? I mean, I, I, I can't understand it, and I, I don't I don't ever like uh, going at the disciple, the, 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 uh, the apostles here, but, but what, how do you respond? Yeah, um, you know, um, I think a lot about the way our emotions work. Uh, and I think this is part of the struggle that we have in the world today is even good people, when evil comes upon us, we have different reactions. You know, St. Thomas talks about this in his Summa. He says, when evil comes upon us, if I think I can overcome it, I get angry. If I think I can't overcome it, I get afraid. And if I can neither overcome it nor escape it, then I get sad. And that's just the way our emotions work, right? And so um, it's normal in certain ways when people experience evil as they do in the world and they feel like, oh, maybe you know the bishops or the priests aren't doing enough to stop this evil, that they get angry. But the question is, what does Jesus ask us to do? Because Jesus gives us a different example. Jesus is able to stand in evil and not give in to anger, fear, or sadness. And that's actually what true courage is. Many people mistake true courage for anger, and it's not the same. Uh, actually, true courage is the ability to stand in evil and to continue to courageously march towards the good and choose the good. 
And one of the things people have to remember is bishops have a very different perspective than everybody else. And a lot of the things, my experience, people get angry about are really prudential decisions that bishops have to make because they're, they're in a particular position, right? And until you have their position where you can see what they see from their perspective, you have to have a certain level of kind of mercy <laughs> towards the fact, and this is why that, you know, even our Lord taught that we have to reverence authority because authority has a certain perspective that I don't have. And so I have to trust that, you know? So, um, you know, you might remember, everybody remembers, of course, what we went through when uh, all the bishops in the country uh, last spring at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis decided to follow the guidelines of the state and say that we can't have public mass. Now, just the fact that every bishop in the country did it tells you something, right? <laughs> like if every bishop saw it the same way, but nobody, and then, then in fact, there must be something there, right? Now that was a prudential decision though. It was, it, was, it was not an easy decision. It was a very painful decision, but it was still a prudential decision. The bishops had the responsibility to decide at the beginning of this pandemic, what is prudent and what's really gonna contribute to safety, both naturally and supernaturally, right? Now, at least in Minnesota, we didn't lock our churches. We didn't close down our churches. People, we, in fact, we had adoration in most of our churches and we found ways to try to bring people the presence of Christ, but we couldn't have public masses because we couldn't gather a lot of people together in the same space because we didn't know what that would do, right? Now then at a certain point, it became clear that places were opening up and the state, at least in Minnesota, was not giving permission for the church to open up. And at that point, all the bishops of Minnesota making a prudential decision said to the governor, you know, governor, you're not actually in control of our churches. And whether or not you give us permission, we're gonna open on this day. We're gonna do it in a safe way, but we're gonna do it because it's our constitutional right to do it and our natural right to do it. And we have a right to be able to worship God. And so the bishops of Minnesota at a certain point took a stand against the governor. But again, those are all prudential decisions that are difficult decisions that um, we have to understand the people who in authority who have to make those decisions have different perspectives than I do, right? And um, that helps, I think, just to have patience with what the bishops have to go through in various ways. What's one thing you've learned about the church or members of the church that um, you didn't know, but you know now over the course of the last 15 months? Um, that's a really good question. I've learned that there are certain people in the church who understand and love the Eucharist. And my experience was those people, they were banging down the doors to get in when we couldn't have public mass. And so those people um, immediately found ways to come back safely once that was possible, you know? And I've also discovered, as we already knew, but it's become more concrete, that there's a large portion of the faithful that doesn't understand the Eucharist and the sacraments. And that raises a grave concern for me as a bishop. How do we invite them to understand? So it's actually one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm chair right now of the uh, Committee for Evangelization and Catechesis for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And um, even before the COVID-19 crisis, you might remember there was the Pew study that showed in 2019 that only 30 some percent of Catholics believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And uh, the bishops were of course very discouraged by that and already were thinking that we need to do something to revive faith in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And so Bishop Barron, who chaired the Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis before I did, had already been meeting with a group of bishops who were leaders of various committees, even before COVID. So this would have been January, February of 2020 to propose a Eucharistic revival. And that was supposed to be presented to the bishops in June of 2020, but that June meeting never happened because of COVID. <laughs> And so it was presented to the bishops in November of 2020, and there was a, an immense amount of support from the bishops. And so I'll be talking about this at the whole Conference of Bishops in just a couple of weeks, but the USCCB is going to do a national three-year Eucharistic revival. And it really, our goal is to renew the church by enkindling a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. 
And we want this revival to touch the church at every level. So we're going to have the first year from 22 to 23, some Corpus Christi 22 until Corpus Christi 23 is going to be what we call diocesan revival. But we're engaging apostolates at every level of the church from the you know small prayer groups that happen in churches to the Knights of Columbus to the various important youth movements that are happening in the church. We're engaging all these apostolates to invite them to focus on the Eucharist for these three years as a way to come together and hold up what we know is most true in our faith. And I've been consistently reflecting on that scripture passage where our Lord says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna lift up the Eucharist first in dioceses across the country, and then the second year will be aimed at parish revival. So we're gonna provide resources so that they can have small study groups in every parish to learn more deeply about the mystery of the Eucharist, to encourage adoration of the Eucharist, to encourage people to reach out to the people in their neighborhood and invite them back to mass. And then in the final year, we're gonna have a national Eucharistic Congress. And so our real goal is that we would form at the end of this, 100,000 missionaries, right? People who have had their lives healed from an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist, transformed by that encounter, and now they're ready to share the truth and love of who Jesus is in the Eucharist. So to me, it's one of the most exciting things. I'm really privileged to be able to chair this committee, which has been handed this initiative, uh, and to use it as an opportunity, especially coming out of COVID, which the bishops see as important, to highlight what we know we need, which is this focus on the Eucharist as a whole church in the United States, as a way to bring unity, to bring healing, and to remind ourselves about what's most true and what's most important. So stay tuned for that because you'll be hearing a lot about it in the years to come. I'm pumped. Sign me up. Good. 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 Let's go. <laughs> I want to help. I love this, Bishop. I mean, that that right there, I mean, it's one, it's one thing to kind of spread ourselves thin in the church. And there's a lot of amazing ministries and, and organizations and apostolates, as you said. But it's another thing when we can just get laser focused on something. And, you know, I've right. seen this in parishes where they just shut everything down and they get laser focused on this one thing for six months. Mm -hmm. And revival is is the word i mean when we can laser focus on the source and summit of our life i, I just think good things are going to start to happen i mean especially over the course of three years so get a big round of applause from me bishop i'm, I'm a big fan of that um i want to talk about the priesthood here for a second because i mean even just yes. hearing you speak um it, this is so ingrained in you this there's a great love for the priesthood and we've oftentimes said no no priest no eucharist and there's a tie there uh, a, a clear, at least, tie to me that if we're going to, in the best way we can, by the grace of God, understand a little bit of the Eucharist and what, what mm -hmm. gift our God has given us, we've got to also understand the priesthood. So let me ask you this basic question. Someone comes up to you in an airport, you're sitting there hanging out, and they say, I see that little tab thing that you got going on, and you're wearing all black. What, what are you? You say, I'm a priest. And they say, what's a priest? How would you respond? Mm -hmm. I would say the priesthood is the greatest institution in the history of the world because it was instituted by Jesus Christ to bring salvation to the world throughout time. And so as a priest, my job is to make present the saving love of Jesus. St. John Vianney would just say, the priesthood is the heart of Jesus Christ. That my job is to make present Jesus in all that I do. And because I have this great privilege to make his power present in a way that no one else can, through the sacraments, most especially we see it in confession and communion. Because of that, I also then have a whole way of life that I'm called to live, right? Because of who it is that I serve and how I represent. But I would just simply say my job is to represent Jesus. When you think about it, uh, what greater power is there on earth? So someone comes into the confessional and I say, your sins are forgiven. I don't just say, God, please in your kindness forgive this person's sins, right? That's actually what happened in the Old Testament. That was the kind of sense. I go and offer this sacrifice and the priest in the Old Testament, he offers the sacrifice on my behalf and says, God, please forgive this person's sins. No, I say, I absolve you. Your sins are forgiven. I don't have that power, but God does. And God through the sacramental character, which he's given me in ordination, actually works through me 
and I become the instrument of the greatest power on earth. Those keys, you know, that St. Peter got from Jesus, which they're not real keys, but they, they're symbolic keys, right? Once I was given a tour of St. Peter's to some uh, non-Catholics, and there's a, a relief, you know, and it shows Jesus handing the keys to Peter. And the woman, she said to me, now, are those the real keys that, that Jesus gave to Peter? And I said, well, <laughs> there weren't real keys, you know, <laughs> the keys right. are symbolic, but they're symbolic of the greatest power on earth, which is the power to loose on earth and have it be counted in heaven. The power to give eternal life, which is what happens through the sacraments, right? And same thing with the Eucharist. Here we make present, as I was saying in the talk, the greatest act of worship that ever happened. Jesus is gift of himself to the Father on the cross, right? And we join in that worship, but we can only do that if Jesus himself acts, and he acts through the person of the priest. And so we often say the priest is a bridge or a mediator, but the priest makes present reality of God in an immediate way. Let me give you one final example. Uh, back in 2005, I had the great privilege of going to a small country between Poland and Russia called Belarus. And it's been in the news recently because of the political turmoil that's there in Belarus. And the archbishop's been locked out of Belarus at various times. Anyway, um, Belarus, was a country where Stalin went in with his troops in the 30s and he killed every priest and leveled every church. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that in Poland because Poland, which is right next door, was too Catholic. You know, there would have been a complete revolution. But there, the Catholics were a minority in Belarus. And so the Orthodox Christians got by easier, but the, all the Catholic priests were killed and the churches were all leveled. I went to that to Belarus in 2005, and I met the priest from Poland who had come to Belarus in the late 1980s. And he was the first Catholic priest to come back to Belarus since Stalin had killed all the priests. I met the guy, and he, he took me to a small Polish village outside of this town in Gomel, Belarus, which is on the Russia border. And he said when he first arrived there, um, he, he met a couple of Catholics in Gomel, there weren't many, and they said, oh, you got to go to this village where there are Polish Catholics just outside of town, about a half an hour outside. So it's 1989. You know, he got in his car, he drove out there. And when he got there, he said the women and the children and the men, they came out of their houses and they saw him dressed as a priest. And they started to weep because they hadn't seen a priest in 60 years. And and then they told him the stories they took him to the place where their church had been and showed him the foundation, how it had been destroyed. They took him to the tomb of their priest. And they told him how they kept the faith, how they would gather on Sunday and they would take the missal and they would each read a part of the missal for the mass. And they'd hand it around the circle, you know, until they got to the words of consecration because they had no priest to say those words. And so they would just sit in silence and long for the Eucharist. And they said, you know, they, of course, would pray the rosary every day and they baptized their children and they taught their children the catechism. They said when things really got bad and they wanted to be forgiven for their sins, they would go to the tomb of their priest and they would speak their sins out loud over the tomb of the priest, hoping that God would forgive them. I and mean, I'm sure God did forgive them. Right. But now imagine if you said to those people, you know, what? What do you need a priest for? You can go straight to God. <laughs> and of course, they could go straight to God but they couldn't have the sacraments. And they knew that the sacraments provide this immediate contact with God, this contact with God that's so close because it actually comes to us physically. And they longed for that, but they couldn't have it because they didn't have a priest, right? It's powerful. It's the reality. Yep. It's powerful. And one of the things that I've always just found fascinating too is the relationship with the, um, with amongst the sacraments themselves right so you have the mm -hmm. the sacrament of, mm -hmm. of uh, holy orders and then there's the relationship between the sacraments of of confession and uh, reconciliation and um and eucharist mm -hmm. talk about the relationship between confession and in the eucharist good question so all the sacraments are ordered to the eucharist it's the sacrament of sacraments <laughs> because it makes present the very act of our salvation and so we're baptized and then we're filled with the Holy Spirit in confirmation. And then we become fully initiated at the sacrament of the Eucharist, right? Um, 
the sacrament of the Eucharist in that sense is often considered the summit of the sacraments of initiation. But the sacrament of the Eucharist is the sacrament of the reconciled, we say. It's the sacrament of those who are living in communion. That's why we receive communion as a sign that we're living in communion. And we know the reality, and the church has always known this reality, that people sin after baptism. And if I sin, especially in a serious way, I separate myself from communion. Jesus says this in John 15, right? He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you have life. If you are disconnected from me, you will wither and die. And that's what serious sin does. It's why we call it mortal sin, right? It, it takes the life of God. It cuts the branch off from the vine. And so I need to be reconciled before I come back to communion or else my amen is false. This is exactly what St. Augustine said. He said, let your amen be true. Make sure that you live the way that you Jesus told us to live before, or when you receive communion, you're actually committing a great lie, right? Because you're saying, amen, I want to live in communion, but you're not doing that with your life. And so the church has always taught from the earliest days, this is actually the origin of the sacrament of confession. When people committed grave sin, they couldn't just come back to mass. They needed to be reconciled first. And in the beginning, that happened through the order of penitence. You know, they confessed their sins and they had to do penance for some time. Gradually, that developed into the sacrament of confession as we know it today, right? So in this way, the two sacraments are intimately united um, because all of us are sinners and sometimes we commit grave sins, right? And in that, we need the sacrament of confession in order to reconcile us so that we are in communion and therefore ready to receive communion. And then communion becomes a strengthening of us. If I do that otherwise, though, and St. Paul says this very clearly in 1 Corinthians 11, if I come to communion when I haven't been reconciled, St. Paul says, the one who eats and drinks in an unworthy way eats and drinks condemnation upon themselves. And so there's an essential connection there. If my life is not being lived in accord with Catholic Church teaching and in accord with the truths of Jesus' gospel, then I need to reconcile that before I come to communion through confession. You mentioned that when someone says to you, uh, or used to say to you, Father, and now Bishop, uh, Mass is boring, and you'd say, uh, you know, it's not boring, you just don't know what's really going on. What is going on at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? What's going on is uh, what went on on Calvary, right? The same Jesus who was born of the Virgin Mary, walked on earth, suffered and died, is now becoming present here. And so as I said in the talk, there's really two things that happen. One is the representation of what happened at Calvary in an unbloody manner, we say, right? So under the appearance of bread and wine, Calvary itself, the sacrifice of Jesus, is represented. So that's the first thing that's going on. Padre Pio used to reflect on this a lot. Of course, this was a man who lived very intimately uh, with Jesus on the cross, right? He, he bore the wounds of Christ in his body. And he used to speak about this idea that it was actually painful for him in certain ways to celebrate Mass because he was so, he knew so well what happened on the cross, you know? Mm. And that's what I mean by um, the fact that Jesus uh, gave his life to give us this gift. And so there we should never receive it casually, right? Because it cost him his life to give us this gift. Now, it's not that Jesus suffers again at the Mass, because um, what's happening is we're being connected with that original moment, right? The original moment of Jesus' self-gift is being united with us in this moment of the church-making memory. So it's not like it happens again, but it is renewed, right? But then the second thing that happens is Jesus' resurrected present becomes presence. So when the priest says, "This take this all of you, eat it, this is my body given up for you, the body of Jesus becomes present. But also because Jesus' body is right now in heaven connected to his blood, <laughs> as well as his soul and his divinity, all that Jesus is. And since Jesus can't be separated from his body, everything that Jesus is becomes present in this piece of bread. And the smallest particle of that bread contains all of Jesus. 
This is also the miracle of what St. Thomas Aquinas called transubstantiation. It's a bit of a difficult concept sometimes, but it's not that difficult. Most people, anybody with a college degree, which is a lot of people, can understand this, right? And so it's basically this idea of a change of the substance. A better word today would be essence, right? And so we know there are different kinds of change. There's accidental change, which is the change that happens when baby Bishop Andrew becomes adult Bishop Andrew, right? Every A lot of things change in that, but the difference between my, myself as one month and myself now, there's a lot of difference, but it's the same substance, same me, right? In fact, it was the same me at the very first moment in my mother's womb, right? Same me from the first one-celled organism. It's just accidental changes that happen between that person and me because it's the same person. But when I die, what happens? Well, a whole other thing happens. The body laying there that's now got no soul, that all the cells are now working independently and decomposing because there's nothing to hold them in unity. And that's not Bishop Andrew. That's Bishop Andrew's dead body. It's a different substance, a different essence, right? And that's a substantial change. It, the diff so the difference with the Eucharist is this. In every other kind of change, something changes and something remains the same. So accidental change, the accidents change. What we say is the appearances, the size, the shape, the volume, that all changes. But the substance remains me, Bishop Andrew Cousins, right? In substantial change, normally both the substance and the accidents change and what remains the same is the molecules, right? It's the same molecules that make up the dead body as the live Bishop Andrew, but they're two different things. And you can distinguish them easily as being different substances or different essences, right? The Eucharistic miracle is this one. That is the accidents or the appearances remain the same, but the substance changes. And it's the only way that Jesus could be present in every host throughout the world because he doesn't have quantity he doesn't have shape or size or any of those things. And so he's present in a miraculous way, but in a very, very real way. We could even say a physical way because he's certainly there, right? Even though he's not there in the way that bodies are normally in a place. Because normally when your body's in a place, it has shape and size and color and weight and his body and blood, soul and divinity have none of those things. After we receive Jesus and Holy Communion worthily in the state of grace, what should we be saying? What should we be doing? Very good question. We should be asking Jesus to enter more deeply into our hearts and to remove anything in our hearts which is not of him. You know, Mother Teresa used to always say, give Jesus permission to use you without your permission. <laughs> And so this is the moment of deep surrender of our lives to Jesus. And so we should be allowing everything in us to be given to him so that we can receive everything that's in him. And of course, he's very specially present to us in those few brief moments after communion when he's sacramentally present. But then he continues to live in our soul intentionally because the Trinity dwells in those who are in a state of grace. How long is he sacramentally attached to us? How long is he within me? Um, and does that you get know, digested? Yeah, basically the, 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 the technical piece is this. As soon as the accidental properties of bread and wine break down, then the presence of Jesus is sacramentally no longer there, right? So as soon as those accidental properties are completely broken down within my body, then the sacramental presence is Jesus is no longer there. So as long as that the accidental properties last, his sacramental property lasts. Most of the saints, it seems they said that's about 10 or 15 minutes. Hmm. So from the moment I receive communion. That's why Saint Mary Mary that? used Go ahead. Go ahead. That's why Saint Neil no, Philip Neary, if somebody left mass early, Saint Philip Neary would put two candles on either side of the person and what make the follow them throughout the streets because they still had the presence of Jesus in, in them, you know. I love it. Um, where does Mary play in all of this in, in our Eucharistic Lord? Talking all things Eucharist, is, is Mary just a totally separate, you know, theological uh, construct I need to understand, or is she involved in this somehow? No, Mary um, is the perfect model of receptivity. And so she shows us what a totally open heart looks like. And her fiat is the perfect example 
of the gift of self that is worthy of Jesus on the cross, right? Let it be done to me according to your word. And so she becomes for us the model, and not just a model, but an intercessor. You know, Mother Teresa used to always pray, uh, lend me your heart. In fact, I made it my motto. You can't see it, but on the my coat of arms behind me is my motto, and it says, Pray be nobis cortum, which is a prayer to Mary from St. Louis to Montfort. Lend us your heart. And what are we saying? Mary, give me your heart so that I can receive Jesus with the same love that you received him. Because that heart is totally open to him, right? And that's exactly the way she works. As an intercessor and as a mother, she slips in to our hearts and she helps us to remove the obstacles and pull up the weeds and open up so that we can become a pure vessel. And that's why all the saints said in a, a relationship with Mary is essential to the Christian life because she's the very first member of the church. She's the most important member of the church, not the Pope, Mary. <laughs> And so and even priests, right? She's more important than them because she shows what it means to be a true disciple perfectly. And so the closer we draw to her, the more she's going to help us to open our hearts completely to him. Just a couple minutes left, friends, but I want to have a little fun with the bishop here. So I'll ask you some questions. That I just want you to answer with the first thing that hits you. All right. First, we'll make okay. it easy. Favorite book of the Bible. Um, Acts of the Apostles. Why? Uh, because I just love the action of the Holy Spirit, and I love St. Paul and all of his, his glory. I love the fact that he gives a sermon and somebody falls asleep and dies, and then he raises them from the dead. <laughs> love that. I love that. Um, favorite saint? Um, saint John Paul II. Uh, I met him several times in my life. I met him several times in my life. I got to meet him three separate times, kiss his ring, you know, and uh, he was from the earliest days, right before I entered seminary at World Youth Day in Denver. He just, uh, he had a fire in his heart and you could see it. And as soon as I saw that, I said, I want to be like him. I'm, uh, I'll follow that man wherever he goes because uh, the fire in his heart. And he just sort of raised the flag and said, I'm, I'm going for sanctity. Anybody want to come along? And I was like, yeah, I want to come along. <laughs> Favorite saint you would most like to meet that you've never met? Mm. In the history of Good the church. question. Yeah. Boy, there'd be a lot of them if I could, but. Um, you get one besides I'll, Mary and besides Joseph. <laughs> I'll say, um, I'll say St. Augustine, just because I studied his preaching so much over the years. And again, he's such a great mind, but he had lived quite a life. And so he, he was a humble man because of the life that he lived. So just the, the opportunity to meet him would have been, would have been a great thing. You took another one of my questions. I was going to say, who would you rather study, Augustine or, or Aquinas? You're going Augustine? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, I studied both of them extensively. I studied Aquinas extensively and Augustine. I think you got to have both. In fact, uh, Aquinas, whenever he just said the theologian, he meant Augustine. The philosopher was Aristotle, but the theologian yeah. was Augustine. <laughs> the one okay. saint you would most not like to sit down and have an hour conversation with. <laughs> I, I got mine. I shared it on, on another interview, but I got to know yours. I can't think of any. I mean, who wouldn't want to meet a saint? Which saint wouldn't I want oh, to meet? I, Saint, John, sure that, saint John, the, John, the, John the Baptist, man. I, he would scare <laughs> me like crazy. He'd sit down with that hair shirt, eating locusts, and I'd just be like terrified <laughs> the whole true. time, just staring at him like that. That's man, true. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I've he heard that Saint in. Damien. St. Damien could be a bit gruff, I heard. St. Damien yeah. of Malachi, you know. So may maybe he would be a little bit gruff. Holier saint, Monica or Augustine? Oh, well, Monica, because moms are always holier than their sons. <laughs> That's the answer, man. That's no, a shout there's no Augustine shout without out. Monica. Um, exactly. There's no Augustine <laughs> without Monica. If you had one thing to say uh, to the Catholic faithful here regarding the Eucharist, what's your what are your parting words? What would you most like to convey? If you, um, I'll, I'll quote Pope Benedict, who in a homily he gave to newly ordained priests, he said, um, he said, there's no um, halfway with Christ in the Eucharist. We either shake off the Eucharist with all of its demands and we gradually grow away from him. Or he said, we cling to him with all that we have. Of course, he's talking to priests, but it's true for everybody. And we cling to him 
And he says, anyone who clings to Jesus in the Eucharist, anyone who consistently seeks Jesus in the Eucharist will never be left behind by him because in his mercy, he's always going to give us strength. So, I mean, I became convinced years ago about the importance of a daily holy hour. Uh, Fulton Sheen, uh, one of my favorites, helped convince me of that, of something I've tried always to be faithful to, partially because I know if I cling to Jesus in the Eucharist through daily mass and daily holy hour, he'll never leave me behind. I love it. Uh, Bishop, this was uh, a great birthday gift for me today to be able to be with hey, you. Hey, happy and birthday. How old are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm 36 years old. I'm feeling it in the back a little bit now. Feeling <laughs> it in the back and I'm out there, but I want you to know this was a treat for me. And I know it was a treat for everyone that was able to listen. Would you give us your blessing? Absolutely. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon each of you and remain with you forever. God bless you. Amen. That's Bishop Cousins, everyone. God bless you, Bishop. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this today. Thank you.